So, 1 Samuel chapter 27. Um, of course, last week we were in chapter 26, and there in chapter 26 we saw uh, what was almost a replay of the events of chapter 24. Um, there were plenty of differences, of course, but the, the similarity was that David could have killed Saul, yet chose to spare Saul's life. He had this conviction not to touch the Lord's anointed, uh, but to allow the Lord uh, to do with Saul as he willed. Um, of course, you know, God had anointed David to be the next king of Israel, but that was up to God's timing. And to some extent, David understood this, and he was willing to, to yield to the Lord's timing. But at the same time, it was, of course, really hard for David. He was not only under the threat of being killed by Saul, he was essentially exiled. In fact, in the last chapter, David lamented in verse 19, For they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. You see, the lies of Saul's men and Saul's continual pursuit of David was preventing him from being able to live in his family lands inside of Israel. And it was also keeping him from being able to worship the Lord at the tabernacle. And from chapter to chapter, it, it seemed as if David has resolved himself to dependence on the Lord. But suddenly, again, we almost get this feeling like he's starting to rely on himself. When you read through David's Psalms, he seems to have these extreme moments of exhilaration and then extreme moments of doubt and discouragement. And chapter 26 is one of those times when it seems like David would, would have been on a great spiritual high. But then in the beginning of chapter 27, we find that he's really in this valley of doubt and he's acting impulsively. In his later years, David recorded God saying, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule. That's in Psalm 32. Do not be like the horse or like the mule. Uh, an interesting instruction from the Lord. You know, the horse is impulsive, tries to throw its rider. It rushes forward. It wants to go where it wants and, and requires a, a whip to follow directions. The mule is stubborn and, and holds back. And all of us have done and do both. God doesn't want to deal with us in the way that, that people have to deal with animals. He wants to be close to us. He wants to guide us with his instructions uh, the way that a parent guides a child. Here's record some experiences of David when he was... Um, bucking against the Lord, instead of being attentive to the Lord's loving guidance. Now, in the last chapter, David had kind of strangely alluded to going to the lands of the ungodly, and now in this chapter, David follows through on that thought, going to the land of the Philistines. It's an indication of David's desperation, and, and unfortunately an indication of his doubt that he was prepared to go to the very enemies that he had successfully fought uh, on Israel's behalf and offer them his services. He may have gone over to the Philistines in an act of desperation, but you know, David didn't have any intention of becoming a traitor to his own people. But to live in Philistine territory, he was going to have to appear to be a traitor. And he does just that, and it actually works out. This was not David's first attempt to, uh, you know, to enlist Philistine protection on his behalf, as you may remember. Uh, he had fled to Gath uh, before that was recorded in, in chapter 21, and that was a really humbling experience for him in which he had, he had to act insane in order to get out alive. This time... However, this situation turns out to be quite different. So let's pray and, and we'll dig into uh, chapter 27. Lord, this evening as we open up your word, 
we desire to hear from you. We, we don't desire man's wisdom or man's words. We desire your wisdom and your words. So we ask that you would please soften our hearts to receive from you. Uh, te teach us about uh, your love for us and your guidance for us and uh, how we can love one another as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's uh, just start with verse 1 here. And David said in his heart, now I shall perish some day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better than there's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. All will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over with the six hundred men who were with him to Ahish, the son of Maoch, king of Gath. So David dwelt, in, dwelt with Ahish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam, uh, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. Notice that it immediately starts out and says, David said in his heart. The heart that the Bible often speaks of is not the, you know, the muscle in our chest that pumps the blood. Scripturally, the heart is the seat of the emotions. This is why in Scripture, the heart is at times described as troubled, fearful, joyful, and glad, or even filled with hatred or filled with love. The heart is the location of the intellect, the place where knowledge and understanding reside. It's the seat of emotions, the seat of the will, the seat of morality. Uh, when we say Jesus is seated on the throne of my heart, we're not talking about Jesus you know, sitting on a little throne uh, in our physical hearts. Instead, it's about handing over those things that are seated in our hearts to Jesus, um, our emotions, our will, our morality, our knowledge, our understanding, our intellect. We hand those things over to the Lord to do with as he wishes. And we see this illustrated really well in the language of Proverbs 4, 20, 23, where it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. David's issue here, it's, it's not manic depression. Some would, would have you believe that David was a biblical example of manic depression, severe ups and severe downs. But the true problem was that at times he yielded himself over to the Lord, and at other times he himself climbed back on to the throne of his heart. And, and so we have this phrasing here, David said in his heart. He was acting not according to what he knew, but according to what he felt. And our feelings very often lie to us, drawing us away from that which is the truth. So what is the truth here? The truth here is that God had chosen David as the next king of Israel, and God's prophet Samuel had anointed David for that purpose. God had seen David through all the difficulties up to this point, and God would see him through whatever was to come. But David is listening to his feelings, and he feels that taking matters into his own hands would be better than waiting on the Lord. The hide-and-seek existence in the Judean wilderness was getting to him. Saul's predictable false repentance, followed by his renewed hunting down of David, was taking its own toll as well. What we have recorded for us here in 1 Samuel are the important events. What we don't have recorded is the day-to-day -day struggle for survival. And it was all getting to him. Now, how much worse, then, you know, could living with the Philistines be? David couldn't live in his family's own land. He had to stay in hiding in Israel. His own people were, were revealing his position to Saul. He couldn't worship the Lord at the tabernacle. He was in exile in the land. I mean, how much different could it, could it be actually living then with the Philistines? Now, Gath was one of five major Philistine cities. Ashdod and Ashkelon 
uh, were both coastal cities. Gath then was about 10 miles inland, kind of in the, if you imagine a triangle from the coast going in, it was kind of in the shape of a triangle there. And in fact, the, the ruins of Gath are, are still visible today. You can actually go there and you can visit uh, the, the tell that, that at one point was Gath. And, and around that entire site of, of Gath, and still visible, uh, is uh, these ancient siege fortifications that were built by King uh, Hazael, who, according to 2 Kings 17, destroyed Gath. Now, surprisingly, David would actually find welcome from the king of Gath, from Achish. He would provide refuge for David on two separate occasions and actually considered him an ally. Now, Achish first appears back in chapter 21, and that's when David escapes from Saul and then seeks refuge uh, in Gath, but, but has to deceive Achish by pretending to be insane. It's because all the people recognized him when he came into the city and were saying, isn't that David king of Israel? They recognized him as king of Israel, even though he wasn't at the time. Isn't that David king of Israel, the one about whom they sang these songs? <laughs> And so David, carrying the sword of Goliath at the time, thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I've made a mistake. Um, and he had to pretend to be insane to get out of that. Um, the title of, of Psalm 34 actually refers to that episode. But it's interesting that that psalm, in, in the, the title of that psalm, it actually uses the name Abimelech in place of Ahish. Um, and that's probably because Avi Melech is also a title. It's, it, it's a name. It's used in the Old Testament as a name, but it's also used as a title because it means father king. Um, so it's likely that Ahish actually went by both names, one, one his name Ahish and one a title Abimelech. Um, so David had deceived Ahish by pretending to be insane, and, and then the second time David would deceive him again but by lying about the location of raids he conducted against neighboring villages. Now, we'll get more into those raids as we study. The hospitality that uh, Ahish offered David at Gath um, in welcoming not only David, but you have to remember David had an army of 600 uh, men and, and, of course, wives and children that would be along. That, that's remarkable that he offered such hospitality. Um, and it, it really demonstrated a few things. First, David's power to, you know, to, to I guess, charm uh, his way into the king's goodwill. Um, but also, God's continued care of David. In fact, even though this was technically what we might think of it as a stumble for David, God was going to use it to shore up David's eventual kingdom. These raids that he would conduct would actually serve a purpose in regards to that future kingdom. Now, verse 4 tells us that with David's seeming defection, Saul then sought David no more. Verse 5. Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Ahish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. <clears throat> now, the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. From every point of view, it was good that David should move away from Achish and the capital Gath. For the king, it must have been, well, it must have been the subject of, of a lot of gossip with the people around that he had allowed David and this army of 600 to start dwelling in Gath. And for David, it was good because he needed uh, freedom to operate without being observed too closely by Achish. Now, uh, Achish's choice of Ziklag for David was particularly suitable. Uh, for Achish, it provided what he must have felt was a, a profitable kind of trophy relationship with this exiled 
uh, Israeli conqueror. It, it provided distance to, to silence criticism uh, that he may have been receiving from those who wanted to gossip about why David was there. And also with David on his side, he may have also hoped to have won the support of Judah against Saul. Um, this might have enabled him then to take the whole land as he very nearly does in the battle that's coming up, the Battle of Mount Goboa that we'll read about more in the, the preceding, in the next few chapters. Now for David, it was a matter of distance and location. Ziklag was about 14 miles south of Gath. It was in the foothills. It was, it, uh, it was in Philistine territory, but it was also in land that was actually allocated to the Israeli, Israelite tribe of uh, Simeon. Now, it was far enough from the major cities of the Philistines for David to be able to operate, and it was just far enough from Saul's territory for him also to operate. Now, in Joshua 15.31, Ziklag is listed among Judah's towns, but either it was never occupied or it was reconquered at some point by the Philistines. Its main disadvantage was that it tended to be the target of uh, marauding peoples coming up out of the desert. Now, perhaps this was another advantage then for Achish. David and his men could provide some protection from those Amalekites, uh, Geshurites, and Gerzites that would come up and raid. Uh, the Amalekites... You guys may remember that name. That's, that's the same group that came, in, came against Israel back in Exodus. Um, the, the Geshurites are also mentioned in Joshua 13 among the people that had been left unconquered by Israel in the conquest of Canaan. They lived between Philistia and Egypt. The Gerzites, we don't know much about them. Uh, they may have lived in the Mount Gerizim area. That's an area that's later associated with the Samaritans. Now, the text here says that these were groups that had dwelt in this land from ancient days. The job of conquering all the land of Canaan had been left incomplete by the Israelites. David, during his reign as king, would expand that kingdom, defeating many of the peoples that were left from that original conquest, and he seems to be starting to do that here even before he has uh, assumed the throne. In fact, he would eventually defeat the Philistines so thoroughly that they were never again a serious threat to the Israelites. Verse 9. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither <clears throat> man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, Where have you made a raid today? And David would say, Against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the, of the uh, Jeremiahites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, thus David did, and thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the land of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. So David then and his men began to invade all those areas around them. They would go out and they would totally wipe out a, a, a city or a dwelling. They'd kill everybody so there'd be no one who could come back and, and tell Achish what was happening. Verse 10 says that Achish would ask where David had raided on any given day, and David would report uh, back that he had fought against Judah or Judah's allies, uh, the, the Jeromeelites or the Kenites. And Achish was thinking that the people of Judah then must absolutely hate David. And so he could never return to Israel. So then he, he would be Achish's servant uh, all the time that he was alive. And of course, David was just, he wasn't just blindly raiding for the purpose of raiding. He was defeating Israel's enemies and he was developing relationships with the Judahites that were living in the far south. Now, verse 7 had told us that David and his men lived there 16 months of course, that's, that's plenty of time to, to really establish star, strong relationships with the Israelites that were living in the, area, in the uh, tribal areas of Simeon. Uh, chapter 28, verse 1. 
Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And he said to David, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, surely you know that your servant, what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. So David found himself in, a, in quite a pickle there. And uh, he kind of weasel worded his answer. Uh, Achish took it to mean one thing. I think David actually was meaning another um, so Achish here, he's, he's preparing for war. He, he wants to finally gain supremacy over Israel. And the text doesn't say it here, but we know that this would be the battle in which Saul and his sons would be killed. And so, you know, we see David here in a very difficult spot. Um, not only had Achish committed his army to fight against Saul, but Achish had appointed David now to become his chief bodyguard. And David's answer, of course, uh, was designed to avoid just a, a direct, straight reply. Um, but Achish uh, assumed it meant that, that David was all for him. And David, of course, by his words, is meaning something else. Verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. This information, this is a repeat of information we've already learned from another chapter. It's repeated here because it has uh, uh, some meaning for what we're about to, to look at. Uh, verse 4, Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So the battle lines are already drawn, but Saul is frightened. And it seems that he, he really has no heart for this battle. He, he's fearful. What was the source of his fear? He, to this point, he's shown little fear of the Lord. So that doesn't seem like a good legitimate answer. Perhaps it was uh, the size of the Philistine army. Or perhaps it was that Saul knew that David might be with the Philistine army. Well, from the facts here, I think we can surmise that Saul was fearful because he was boxed in. You see, Gilboa is up in the area just south of the Sea of Galilee, and it's well inside Israelite territory. So the Philistines had really pushed Saul and his army back and taken a lot of Israel's land. Uh, Shunem in the valley of Jezreel, where the Philistines were camped, was about 20 miles north of the uh, Philistine city of Aphek. And that's the most northerly, northernly Philistine city. So they had moved inland, in, well, they had moved into Israel's territory a long ways. And their intention, of course, was to continue to press uh, Saul and his armies back to the Jordan. Now Saul, he was at Mount Gilboa, and he chose that probably because of the vantage point so he could see the movements of the Philistines. Um, but here he was feeling really cornered, and he desperately needed someone for counsel. But he finds himself totally isolated. So we look back to verse 1 and that reminder that Samuel had died. And that really emphasizes for us just how isolated Saul was feeling. And, and then the fact that the Lord wasn't answering his inquiries uh, through either the, the priest in the Urim and the Thummim or the prophets. Now, of course, earlier Saul had disregarded Samuel altogether, and he certainly was not in the habit of listening to the Lord. But there was another mention, not just Samuel. There was this mention in verse 1 of mediums and spiritists. Now, the Hebrew word, for mediums is obot, 
And for spiritus is ye donai, or ye doni. Now, one practiced channeling the dead, the other practiced divination. Saul had, had done well in putting them all out of the land. The law of God spoke against them, but now Saul is rethinking that. And the fact that he now regrets this indicates just how far he has departed from his early commitment. When he first was anointed king, he had access to the instruction of the Lord through Samuel. But he had hardened his heart toward those things. Now, like many other things, Saul had not done a good job of kicking the mediums out of the land. In fact, his own servants were well aware that there was still one in the land. And Endor was only a short distance away. It was on the north hill of Moreh. And it was accessible despite the Philistine forces that were close by. Verse 8. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Samuel has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. So Saul disguised himself in order to go to the witch of Endor. For one thing, he didn't want her to be afraid of him. And for another, he knew what he was doing was wrong. It, it's, it's such a picture of confusion. The confusion that really seemed to, to rule Saul's life. I mean, he misses his connection with the Lord, but he's willing to go to a witch, literally a demon-possessed woman. Uh, we, we miss it in the New King James Version in the language here, but in verse 7 where it says medium, it's a different Hebrew word than from verse 1. The word changes. Here it's Ba'Allah, which means one with a familiar spirit. In other words, she was demon-possessed. Now, today, we probably recognize that, that there are many Christians who dabble with things that are demonic, thinking that it's fun and games, and, and not realizing the, the darkness that they're really inviting into their lives. And even in some popular Christian literature and teaching, we find the introduction of occult things, you know, like, like praying in circles. Now, why was Saul seeking to consult with Samuel's spirit here? Maybe he hoped that Samuel would somehow reverse the judgment which he had earlier pronounced against Saul and his kingdom. I mean, he was certainly starting to feel that prophecy nearing its fulfillment here. Later in verse 15, Saul states his reason to Samuel is this. He says, that you may reveal to me what I should do. The unsaid part is probably so that I can avoid this judgment against me. Now, as for the witch, she suspects a trap and she fears for her life. And inconsistent as ever, Saul swears as the Lord lives that she will be safe. Verse 11. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. Now the implication here is that the woman was surprised when Samuel actually appeared. It, it was, it, for one thing, it was a moment of revelation for her. Somehow she realized that the person who she was consulting was Saul, the king. Um, and we're not told how she became aware of this, only that suddenly she became aware. Now what's interesting is that by her reaction, we're given the impression that actually having a spirit appear was an extraordinary event for her. It wasn't something that, that she expected, and, and it frightened her. Verse 13. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. 
Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophet nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. She said, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. A, a more literal translation is, I saw an Elohim coming up out of the earth. The word Elohim, used with plurals, often means, well, it's, it, it is in Scripture, it is used to refer to God, but it's also used uh, referring to judges and authority figures. So, you know, the, the appearance of Samuel here with his mantle, the mantle of a prophet, has clearly impressed the idea of a person with authority upon her. And, and from the text, we can discern that Saul didn't see Samuel. And he's dependent on the woman's description of him. Um, and of course, an old man covered with a mantle, that's kind of a vague description. You might think it would be hard to identify anyone from that, but, but the key word there is mantle. His mantle was the robe of a prophet. And the prophet's mantle was an indication of his authority and his responsibility as God's uh, chosen spokesperson. And it, the mantle that was worn by prophets was probably an animal skin. You may remember from a few chapters back um, how uh, Saul had reached out to, to try and stop Samuel from departing and, and had actually torn a part of, of Samuel's mantle. And that had been uh, interpreted by Samuel as a symbol of, of, of uh, the kingdom being torn away from Saul. In verse 15, Samuel's words are interesting. They, they suggest that Samuel had been enjoying where he was and was reluctant to leave. Now, in regards to Saul's answer to Samuel, Saul is, is asking for guidance when his course of action is obvious. Saul is to fight the Philistines, but what Saul really wants is reassurance that all will be well and that he'll win this battle. Now, I guess the, there's kind of a bigger question here surrounding this whole thing, and, and that would probably be, hey, did Samuel really come back or was this some kind of demonic manifestation? Um, well, I, personally, I see no reason at all uh, not to believe that this happened just as it's written. Um, as I said this past Sunday, I, I found that in the Bible, the obvious interpretation is usually the correct interpretation. If something has to be uh, forced into the text, it, it means we're probably looking for the wrong explanation. Now, I don't understand why God would permit this to happen, but I'm convinced that it happened just as it's written, that it was Samuel that talked with Saul, that the spirit of Samuel was somehow brought back and that it was a genuine experience of dealing with uh, a spirit that had departed and was in another place. But, you know, that's not to say it happens often or, or that it's uh, uh, something that, that even happens apart from this one time. Other times, it, it may be a demonic lie. We have evidence, we have proof here, this time though, that it is not a demonic lie because everything that Samuel says, that this apparition of Samuel says, is exactly what the Lord had said previously through Samuel. So when we see the woman's reaction, her, her shock at seeing Samuel, it, it does seem like this was a unique experience for her. And of course, uh, there's another instance in Scripture where God also allowed uh, two other people to appear in this world from another world. Um, and that's the Mount of Transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah appeared and spoke with Jesus. So then, yes, I, I believe that this was truly Samuel. And he came not because the medium called for him, Samuel appeared because God had a special purpose for it. Verse 16. 
Then Samuel said, why, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell, fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life in my hands and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now, therefore, please heed also the voice of your maidservant, and let me set a piece of bread before you, and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. Samuel, he doesn't in any way change the message that he had spoken to Saul when he lived at Ramah. And he's still the prophet of the Lord, and he speaks in the name of the Lord. In fact, Samuel uses the Lord seven times in those uh, four verses. Now, whereas Saul hoped that the judgment against him would be reversed, what actually happens is it's actually reinforced. The word that he had spoken back in 1 Samuel 15 is about to be fulfilled, and now Saul is told outright that it's David who is going to receive the throne. So the message of 1 Samuel 15, 18 through 19 hasn't been repealed. Instead, it's now repeated and it's about to be fulfilled. The Philistines, who in Saul's early day as king, had defied the armies of Israel. They are about to defeat Saul and his sons. And Samuel says that tomorrow they, that is Saul and his sons, will be with him. The Lord will give the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines, and Saul and his sons will be killed. The time in which Saul could have repented, that has run out. He had plenty of time to repent, but he refused. And we can, you know, we can never assume that, that we have as much time as we want to repent. The desire to repent, the opportunity to repent, these are gifts from God. If we have the desire and the opportunity today, then we need to seize upon that because it may not be here tomorrow. Now, we may have another question here. When Samuel said, you and your sons will be with me, did it mean that Saul and his sons were going to Abraham's bosom? Um, now, if you remember Abraham's bosom, that was the name of the place uh, that the Bible says is the paradise where the believing dead are kept. Now, the answer to the question, which essentially, I guess, could be were Saul and his sons saved, is I don't know. <laughs> um, in, in the story that Jesus told in Luke 16, the, the believing dead and, and the dead who were in unbelief were both in the same general area. The believing dead were in a place of rest, a place of contentment, a place of peace that was called Abraham's bosom. But the, the dead who had died in unbelief were in a place of torment. Now, these two places were separated by a divide, but it seems that they were close enough for the one to be aware of the other. So then, Saul, if he was in the one place, the place of, of suffering, he would still be in the general area in which Samuel was not necessarily in Abraham's bosom. Now, I feel pretty certain that Jonathan would have, but as for Saul, you know, it just can't say. It 
can't say which specific place Saul would have gone to. But what we do know is that Saul, who, you know, he wasn't able to see Samuel, but he was able to hear what the prophet was saying. We know for sure that he was as good as done at this point. And to hear that truth, it, it overwhelmed him with such deep fear that he just fell down and there was no strength left in him. Now, why he had not eaten, we don't know. Perhaps he thought that, that he could earn his way into God's favor with a fast. You know, he had previously attempted to find favor with God through religious ritual. And, and what did Samuel say to him then? Well, in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Of course, what does David also say in Psalm 51? He says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and, con and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. David wrote Psalm 51 after being confronted by the prophet Nathan over his sin. Unlike Saul, David repented. But there were still consequences for David, and his son died. Now, Saul left this encounter with this witch of Endor, he left sorrowful, he left resigned to his fate, and, of course, he, strangely enough, he left with the sympathies of a witch. <laughs> now, all this was the outcome of Saul's willingness to compromise with evil in order to escape the word of the Lord. And it's hard to imagine just a, a more horrible situation in which to find yourself. Verse 23 but he refused and said, I will not eat. So his servants together with the woman urged him and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house and she hastened to kill it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. So Saul, he at first refuses to eat, and he was fasting when he came, and if he had an appetite, he certainly lost it when, when he learned God's judgment was about to come true, but they did persuade him to eat. Um, you know, Saul had begun well, but he stumbled very early on. He had stubbornly resisted the instruction of the Lord that the Lord had brought him through the prophet Samuel uh, in the key battle against the Philistines, Saul had not waited for Samuel to perform the pre-battle ritual at Gilgal. Instead, Saul had presumed to perform that ritual on the, in the sacrifices himself. And that earned him this judgment. Uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And then later, instead of following God's instructions, he spared the Amalekite king Agag and the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the best of the lambs, and uh, all that was good. And Samuel confronted Saul about that, but then he was met with excuses. And to that, Samuel said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Is it irony that, that Saul would later resort to witchcraft trying to speak with Samuel? At Endor, Saul displays the same basic character as he has in earlier chapters. On the one hand, he wanted the best. He had cleared the land of, of those who practiced witchcraft and sought to make contact with the dead, and then with his fast, he was still endeavoring to fulfill this, the external appearance of, of religion the way that he had done in offering the sacrifices back in chapter 13. Then with visiting the witch, Saul had again violated God's instructions. And yeah, Saul had asked for guidance from the Lord. 
But what he had not fully taken in was the fact that he had already received the guidance that was appropriate in his circumstances. And no amount of further requesting could change the word he had already received. Of course, we're going to see the outcome in a few chapters. Now, there are wider implications of this incident at Endor. Through this, we learn just how entrenched Canaanite practices were even among the Israelites. And though violation of the law carried with it the death penalty, and uh, mediums and uh, witches and necromancers and things, they were officially banished from the land, they were still there to be found, and they were ready to, to operate if, if they were given assurance of protection. People wanted their services and they were willing to pay for the, for the privilege. But God's way of speaking to his people wasn't through witches and, and, and through raising uh, spirits. God's means of speaking to his people is through his word and his prophets. And even after his death, the prophet Samuel speaks, but Saul receives the very message he had already heard. In the end, he had to do what he would in any case have done. He had to face the Philistines. The additional information that within 24 hours he and his sons would be dead, well, that was certainly no help to him. Not a boost of morale. He would have been better off without it. Would have been better off not knowing that. So he did himself no good by doing that which he had said was unlawful to do. God's word stood and couldn't be altered. He, he should have believed it instead of thinking that, that by further consultation he could somehow reverse the judgment. And so, you know, in our chapter, when it says that God would not answer him, it was because there was no more to be said. That's where we're going to end tonight. And we'll pick it up with chapter 29, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that. So let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word and your instruction. And Lord, I, I pray that if, if any of us are involved in anything that is uh, of of witchcraft or anything that that uh, is contrary to your word, Lord, that we would uh, be quick to repent. In fact, Lord, we we pray that we would be grounded in your word in all things, Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen.